Welcome back everybody to another reaction video, continuing today with the Epic History TV series on the Napoleonic Wars. So, the last video we looked at Napoleon's ill-fated invasion of Russia in 1812, and today we're going to be taking a look at um, what is arguably the climactic battle of that campaign, which was the Battle of Borodino um, in 1812. And it would prove to be the single bloodiest day's fighting of the entire Napoleonic Wars, and it was this sort of titanic clash um, between the two armies. Um, if any of you have um, seen the, I think it was the BBC series on War and Peace with Paul Dano, um, the Battle of Borodino is featured in that. In that, so as was, you know, the whole thing is sort of centered around Napoleon's invasion of Russia. So um, that's worth checking out too. It's pretty good drama. So. Um, but in the meantime, um, just before we start, as always, if you like what I do here, please leave a like and a comment. Get some engagement going in the comments would be fantastic. Um, if you want to support my channel a bit further, there's always the option to subscribe and make sure notifications are on so you don't miss anything. There's content every Wednesday and Friday coming out, uh, reaction videos, hoping to get some more original content out soon too. Um, if you want to support the channel a bit further, there's also Patreon. Um, please go check that out. Um, there's a link in the description of every video to my Patreon page. Um, the more people that I get there, the more content I can make, because it will be more of a job for me at that point, um, which will be fantastic. So please check that out too. Um, also, there will be links to Epic History TV and to the original video in the description as well, so please go check them out and show them some love. Um, the work they do is absolutely phenomenal. I've said multiple times before that I think they are the best history channel on YouTube in terms of their presentation and quality. You know, the stuff that they make is just, it's TV level quality. It's just really astonishing work. So please go check those uh, guys out too. They do fantastic work. So, but in the meantime, uh, without further ado, let's just dive straight into it. So this is the Battle of Borodino, which is Napoleon's bloodiest day. Let's see what's in store for us. This Epic History TV video is brought to you by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. September 1812. Ten weeks had passed since Napoleon invaded Russia with more than half a million men. The French Emperor wanted a quick victory over the Russians, one that would force Emperor Alexander to make peace and agree to French terms. But at Vitebsk and then Smolensk, the outnumbered Russian army had narrowly escaped his clutches. The holy city of Smolensk had been virtually destroyed. Napoleon had advanced deep into Russia, and months of marching had left his army decimated by disease and exhaustion. It was now half its original strength, and summer was nearly over. But finally, 70 miles west of Moscow, near the village of Borodino, the Russians had turned to offer battle. Napoleon would have a chance to win the decisive victory that he believed would end the war. So we kind of discussed last time as well that this battle was kind of interesting in in the reasons why it was fought, because the Russians didn't need to fight this battle per se. Um, Moscow was already lost, for one thing. You know, it was inevitable that Napoleon was going to capture it. Um, all the Russians needed to do was just wait, you know, just wait for the winter to take hold, wait for attrition to wear Napoleon's army down even further, and he would eventually retreat, because Moscow wasn't even the capital of Russia, St. Petersburg was. And we discussed before the importance of capturing the capital in European warfare. 
So he's taken Moscow, which, yes, is a very symbolic city. You know, in the last video, I kind of compared it to it would be like if an enemy captured New York City, but didn't capture Washington, D.C. You know, it's kind of that kind of psychological impact that it would have. Um, so strategically and tactically, the Russians didn't really need to fight this battle because they could just let Moscow fall into his hands and just burn it to the ground and, you know, leave him nothing, which they do. Um, you know, they just, they scorch earth everything, including the city of Moscow. Pretty much the entire city was burning in flames by the time Napoleon got to it. So they're already planning on giving it up, basically. They know they're going to, but the reason that they're fighting this battle to begin with is because they don't want to be seen as giving it up without a fight, because if they do, it risks destroying the morale of the army and destroying the morale of the people as well, because that's ultimately what's going to see them through. So it's interesting that this battle was fought not necessarily for strategic or tactical reasons in the military sense, but more for psychological reasons. In 1812, Napoleon was master of Europe, but his meteoric rise to power had nearly been cut short several times by cannonballs, bullets, even by Madame Guillotine. His early years are brilliantly retold in the drama documentary Napoleon, available now on documentary streaming service Magellan TV, generous sponsors of this video. Magellan TV offers access to more than 2,000 documentaries on history, science, space and true crime, available through your TV, computer, phone or tablet from as little as $5 a month. New documentaries are added weekly and many are available in glorious 4K. And if you visit MagellanTV.com slash EpicHistoryTV, you can try out their service for a whole month for free. Magellan TV has dozens of programmes we'd happily recommend, from a history of aviation to World War II's Eastern Front. So if you're a history fan, we think this is a great offer. Thanks to Magellan TV for supporting the channel. Russian army, commanded by the 67-year-old, one-eyed veteran General Kutuzov, occupied a defensive position across the two main roads leading from Smolensk to Moscow. General Barclay de Tolly's first army was on the right, its front protected by the Kalatsha River, steep-banked but shallow and easily forded. Prince Bagration's second army was on the left, a more open position, but reinforced by major earthworks, the Great Redoubt, and what the French nicknamed, for their shape, the Flesh, the Arrows. Another forward redoubt at Chevardino was expected to delay the enemy's advance. This is just a complete aside, this has nothing to do with this video, really, or the battle, but... Um, fleshy, or Flesh? Flesh? Fleshes? I don't know how it's particularly pronounced, I think, with the accent. Is that fle fleish, fleishes, I think? Um, someone can perhaps correct me in the comments on that. Um, I'm still learning French, so I've not got to this bit yet, apparently. Um, but um, just as a side, that's where we get um, the word flechette, which is like another name for an arrowhead. And it's also where we get the word Fletcher. Um, historically, a Fletcher was someone that made arrows. So that's where we get that from, just as a, a little interesting tidbit there. Historians still dispute the size of the Russian army. But it's likely Kutuzov had around 121,000 men and 680 guns at Borodino. On the 5th of September, Napoleon's army began to arrive from the west. Around 130,000 men and 585 guns. Napoleon quickly saw that the Chevardino redoubt would have to be taken before he could deploy his army and ordered an immediate assault. The attack was led by Compan's 5th Division of the 1st Corps, supported by the Polish 5th Corps to the south. In several hours of heavy fighting, the redoubt changed hands more than once. 
but late that evening, the Russians finally withdrew to their main line, and the redoubt fell to the French. Its capture had cost them an estimated 4,000 casualties, while the Russians lost around 6,000 men. One thing it also cost the French was time, um, because this is also something that happens at the Battle of Waterloo as well. There's a position on Wellington's extreme right flank uh, called Ugoban Farm. And, you know, Napoleon attacks it, hoping for it to be a kind of diversionary tactic so Wellington peels troops away from his centre to reinforce it, so it leaves his centre vulnerable. Um, but Hugomon puts up stiff, stiff resistance, and they never quite take it, so, you know, they never really capture it. So a attacks coming into the centre are exposed by... Um, are exposed to fire from the flanks as well. So... Um, the, you know, holding Hugomon farm kind of bought the Allies a lot of time. And that's kind of, you know, obviously this is different in that Hugomon didn't fall, but um, I suppose a more apt comparison would be La Haisant, which was the the farm in the middle of Wellington's line, which kind of broke up the French advances as it came forward. Um, but And that was held pretty much throughout most of the day. You know, it wasn't until very late in the day when it was actually captured, which allowed Napoleon to bring his army to bear fully on, on Wellington Centre, and that's kind of the same thing here. So it doesn't really matter if you don't hold it or not, you know, forward positions like this. They're just intended to buy time, and that's exactly what's happened. So, you know, the French have lost quite a lot of time already um, because they had to take this before they could deploy their army fully, because otherwise any advances on the other positions that the Russians held would be dangerously exposed. So, um you know, time is also something else that's valuable, um, you know, just as much as ammunition and logistics. Napoleon noted how few prisoners were taken, a worrying sign of the enemy's unbroken resolve. Both sides spent the next day preparing for battle. Marshal Davout, commanding French First Corps and widely considered Napoleon's most able subordinate, appealed to the Emperor to use his corps to make a wide, outflanking attack to the south. But Napoleon dismissed the idea as too risky, and instead began preparing for a massive frontal assault on the Russian defences. That's interesting, because Napoleon has got to where he is not by playing it safe, he's got to where he is by taking risks, you know, by making these daring, risky, flanking manoeuvres, and, you know, look at the Battle of Austerlitz, you know, he left one of his flanks precariously weak, you know, purely to lure the enemy into doing what he wanted them to do so he could win the day. Um, but this is what I mean, you know, I, I've kind of belaboured the point in other videos, but this is what I mean by Napoleon's tactics are starting to become unrefined. He's starting to kind of become, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, like, what the psychology is necessarily. It's not that he's necessarily becoming bored with fighting, because Napoleon was one of those guys like uh, George Patton, you know, it's just someone that lived to fight, you know, it's just what they wanted to do. Um, so it's kind of interesting that he's becoming so blunt with his tactics, you know, he's just saying, no, you know, let's not um, do the smart thing and outflank the enemy. Um, yes, it's risky, but that's what he's built his career on. You know, he's built his career on taking these kinds of risks. So it's interesting that he's saying no to that, but yes to a frontal assault on a heavily defended fortified position like this. So that's kind of interesting. Shortly after dawn on the 7th of September, Orthodox priests paraded one of Russia's holiest icons, Our Lady of Smolensk, before the Russian army. It was a stirring sight for many devout Russian soldiers, thousands of whom would not live to see dusk. The battle began at 6am, 
as French batteries opened a deafening cannonade against the Russian defences. Eugène's 4th Corps advanced on Borodino village, lightly held by Jaegers of the Russian Imperial Guard. After clearing the village, his infantry crossed the Kalacha and advanced towards the Great Redoubt, but were driven back with heavy losses. The Russians burned the bridge across the river, but did not launch a counter-attack, and Eugène was able to move cannon into the village to put flanking fire on the Great Redoubt. In the centre, Davout's 1st Corps began its advance against the Flèche, coming under heavy fire, while on the right, the Polish 5th Corps, ordered to take Utica, got held up in the woods and ravines. Their slow advance allowed Tushkov's 3rd Corps to send a division north to reinforce the Flesh defences. Kutuzov, at his headquarters in Gorky, took little part in the battle, leaving tactical decisions to his subordinates. Barclay and Bagration had spent most of the summer arguing furiously over strategy, but in the hour of crisis, they put their differences aside. That's actually really commendable too, because so often in, you know, even in modern day, but especially in battles of this period, it was very common for those kinds of petty rivalries to override good judgment. You know, there's thousands of examples of that happening throughout history. Um, you know, political infighting and squabbling often takes precedent over, you know, good strategic decision making. So, um, so yeah, that's actually a commendable trait that they managed to you know, say, okay, to hell with all that, you know, we've got a job to do, we've got a country to, de to defend here, so let's just, you know, argue about strategy later, let's just um, get on with fighting this battle first. So, yeah, that's, because, like, even um, up until this point, you know, we've seen that there's been so much infighting between um, the coalition powers, you know, um, there was the Archduke Charles, for example, the Austrian commander, who was perhaps... Napoleon's most successful opponent up to this point and you know he had a falling out with the Emperor Francis and Francis relieved him of any further command he never commanded an army in the field again um, and he was possibly the Allies most capable field commander at that point so um, yeah it, it's a good you know it's it speaks well of the the Russian army at this time that they managed to put those differences aside so they could see the main French attack was falling on the Russian centre and left. So Barclay ordered General Bagavut's 2nd Corps south to reinforce Bagration. Fighting around the flesh intensified as the French captured one of the earthworks, only to be driven out by a Russian counterattack. Davout himself was injured in the fighting as he fell from his dying horse but he refused to leave the field. When Russian cavalry counterattacked, Marshal Murat himself led the French cavalry forward to meet them. Ney's 3rd Corps now joined the attack on the flesh. A charge by Russian cuirassiers forced Murat to take shelter in a square of Württemberg infantry. Murat, with his flamboyant dress and reckless courage, had now even made a name for himself among the Russians. The Cossacks, in particular, saw him as a kindred spirit, and were eager to capture him alive if they could. To the south, Polish troops now took Utica, which the Russians set ablaze before withdrawing. But General Bagavut's reinforcements arrived just in time to shore up the Russian flank. Around 10 a.m., Eugène launched another attack on the Great Redoubt. It was briefly captured by Morand's 1st Division, before his men were thrown out by a ferocious Russian counterattack. The Russian army's 27 year old artillery commander, General Kutesov, was killed leading one of these counterattacks. A heroic death, but a blow to the organisation of Russian artillery for the rest of the day. 
fighting. Just a quick point on the artillery as well. So there was um, accounts from the battle that I read which um, state that there were so many guns, you know, uh, particularly a lot of these guns were of pretty powerful caliber too. Um, but there were so many guns in such a small, comparatively small space of earth, you know, because the battlefield wasn't, you know, hugely wide for the number of artillery pieces that were there, and they were concentrated in such close batteries um, that when they fired, you know, they were firing so much that it actually created, like, um, sonic pressure waves in the air around um, the battle. It was creating these big sort of you know, fluctuations in pressure. And um, so human beings are, are naturally sensitive to changes in pressure. You know, it's the reason why your ears pop when you go in a plane, for example. Um, but the, the changes in pressure were so much um, around the artillery pieces that were firing that messengers that were riding back and forth across the battlefield said that they started to feel sick. And that's actually because the pressure was messing with the equilibrium in their ears. You know, it was actually making them feel as if they were imbalanced or had like an ear infection or something. And it was actually making them feel nauseous. And that's just a testament to how much artillery was on the field and how, you know, how intense the fighting was. That that's what was happening. You know, it's... Um, kind of a precursor to shell shock in a way, you know, because it was me, the, just the pressure of the artillery firing, um, not even like the concussion effect of the shells or anything, it was just the concussive effect of the guns just firing alone um, that was creating this kind of sickness in people. In continued to rage around the flesh earthworks. Some counted as many as six major French assaults involving 45,000 troops with hundreds of cannon on both sides, pouring fire into the packed ranks. More than once, French infantry fought their way into one of the Russian positions, only to be driven out again at bayonet point. Junot's Westphalian Corps was sent forward in support, helping to clear Russian skirmishers from the woods to the south. General Bagration was close to the action, overseeing the defence of the flesh, leading forward reinforcements and ordering counterattacks. Around 10 a.m., he was hit in the leg by shell fragments. Mortally wounded, he was carried from the field. Shaken by the loss of their iconic commander, the exhausted Russian infantry began to fall back. The French finally took the flesh. Marshal Murat then led forward Friant's division, First Corps' last reserve, supported by waves of heavy cavalry on both flanks. Russian grenadiers formed squares to ward off the French cuirassiers, while their own guard cavalry fought the French in a giant confused melee, with heavy losses on both sides. The Russians resisted doggedly, but the combined onslaught of French artillery, cavalry and infantry proved irresistible. As the Russians pulled back, Friant's infantry fought their way into the village of Simeonovskia. The Russian centre was in disarray and seemed close to breaking. Surely now was the time for Napoleon to deliver the knockout blow. Not exactly what you want to hear from your commander, <laughs> but I guess that just speaks to, you know, just how fierce the fighting was. For most of the day, Napoleon remained at his headquarters near Shevardino. I suppose as well it speaks to that kind of mentality of the time where it was sort of considered very noble to die in the service of your country, you know, and that kind of mentality continued pretty much until I would say the mid 21st uh, mid 20th century um you know it's it's only really recently where at least particularly in the western world and other countries that you know we've started to kind of um become averse to suffering heavy casualties and it's no longer seen as this you know very 
noble thing to want to die in battle. You know, there's the whole, um, it's the, you know, that psychology is kind of reversed. You know, the, the more troops you bring home, the better, you know. So obviously, you know, that's not to say that this, that wasn't a concern at the time, but just that the psychology was sort of slightly different. Those around him later said that illness, as well as the exertions of the long campaign, had left him tired and irritable. As the Russian centre buckled, Murat and his staff urged him to send forward his last reserve, the Imperial Guard. The Emperor refused. If there is another battle tomorrow, he asked them, where is my army? But he did make one exception. Barclay was continuing to move troops from his unengaged right wing to bolster the centre. As Osterman Tolstoy's 4th Corps arrived behind the Russian centre, French observers feared they were massing for an attack. So Napoleon ordered forward General Sorbier's guard artillery. His batteries opened a devastating fire on the enemy. Yet even as they were mown down in their ranks, the Russian infantry stood their ground. On the Russian right wing, all remained quiet, so General Platov, commander of the Don Cossacks, proposed that he lead an attack on the lightly defended Borodino village. Permission received, Generals Platov and Uvarov led a force of 8,000 Cossacks and cavalry across the Kalacha River. They fell on French and Italian troops around Borodino with complete surprise, spreading panic and disorder. Grushi's 3rd Cavalry Corps had to be pulled back across the river to drive off the Russians. Russian commanders saw this raid as a missed opportunity, but it had delayed the next French attack by two hours, and may have persuaded Napoleon that he was right to hold back his reserve. Yeah, I can kind of see both sides there, because obviously if the Russian, if, yeah, sorry, if the Russian attack had been supported by the infantry here and perhaps some of these artillery, it's possible that they could have destroyed the French left wing, you know, and sent it into flight, which would have put the French centre here um, at great risk because it would have, you know, relieved pressure on the Great Redoubt here, which would have freed up perhaps some of these troops as well. Um, and it would have begun the process of sort of encircling Napoleon's army. So, um, yeah, I can kind of see from the Russian perspective that they did see it as a missed opportunity because as well, one of the tenets of um, warfare is that you don't send in unsupported attacks. You, know, you don't send in cavalry alone without infantry and artillery. You don't send in infantry alone without artillery and cavalry and so on and so on. Um, you know, that was actually one of the things that let the French down at um, the Battle of Waterloo, which is, you know, I've spoken about this before, the massed French cavalry attacks on Wellington Centre. And all they did was ride around the squares and get mown down because they weren't supported by infantry or artillery until too late. Um, so that's kind of like one of those tenets of, of battle. You know, maybe the Russian commanders, maybe Katusov and others, um, and Barclay kind of maybe thought that, you know, that... It was only really intended as, you know, just to keep the enemy off balance. They weren't really intending it as a complete flanking manoeuvre, perhaps. Um, but yeah, it, it is a missed opportunity in that sense. But, you know, just that alone was enough to convince Napoleon that he was correct to hold back his Imperial Guard because he needs a ready reserve in case anything happens. You know, had the French left flank collapsed, you know, then he would have had to have deployed the Imperial Guard to shore it up. So there's that too. Um, but it's kind of that psychology, uh, it's kind of like the landmine psychology that I've brought up before, which is that, you know, you place one landmine in an enemy's path. You know, you don't place any others, you just place one. That one landmine explodes and perhaps kills someone or wounds them, but it slows down everybody else because now they're thinking, well, is there any more ahead of us? You know, we've got to now search and scour the area and, you know, that slows them down. And it's kind of that similar psychology where it's like, it was one attack, you know, it wasn't a serious attempt to turn the French flank or anything like that. Um, it just caught them off guard and kept them off balance, but it's enough to convince Napoleon to not take risks, which is kind of turning his own um, cunning against him.
Around 3 p.m., the French launched their biggest assault yet on the Great Redoubt. Russian gunners targeted the French infantry advancing to their front, allowing French cavalry to outflank the redoubt and charge it from the rear. Saxon cavalry were first in, cutting down Russian infantry and gunners almost to the last man. It was an astonishing feat by the horsemen, against all the rules of war and testament to the ferocity of the fighting. As Eugène's infantry consolidated their hold on the redoubt, he ordered forward all the available cavalry to exploit this success. But they were met and checked by the last Russian cavalry reserves. Eugène now implored Napoleon to commit the Imperial Guard. But again, the Emperor refused. I will not destroy my guard, he told his staff. I am 800 leagues from France, and I will not risk my last reserve. I can kind of see his point, because yes, you don't want to risk your last reserve in a battle that might get them killed or, or destroyed, because the Russians are putting up ferocious resistance here. You know, this is perhaps the fiercest that Napoleon's ever been resisted on the field of battle. Um, but also... You know, to contrast that, he's, you know, he's, I don't know if it's perhaps because the Imperial Guard are his favourites, you know, they're his, like, picked troops kind of thing, they're his personal bodyguard, so to speak, you know, it's the one unit that he always exercised direct command over, you know, regardless of what else was going on, so maybe it was a case of, you know, well, I don't want my favourites to all die, you know, kind of thing, I don't know if, you know, maybe that played a part in the psychology of his decision, um, but like I said, it speaks to the kind of man that Napoleon was becoming at this point, which is he was still very much a vaunted commander, but his tactics are becoming blunt, they're becoming unrefined. You know, he's less of a scalpel and more of a sledgehammer at this point. By 5pm, both armies were in a state of utter exhaustion. The battlefield was strewn with dead and wounded. Some infantry battalions could muster only a third of their strength. Cavalry could advance no faster than a trot. Gun crews were collapsing with fatigue. As dusk approached, fighting slowly died out across the battlefield. Napoleon and the French army expected the fighting to resume the next day. But by dawn, Kutuzov, having learned the full, horrifying scale of Russian losses, had ordered a withdrawal. The losses on both sides were enormous. Russian casualties are estimated at 44,000. French losses, around 30,000, including 49 generals, 12 of them killed. That's just insane, because if you think something like the Battle of Gettysburg, which I believe it wasn't the bloodiest single day, that was Antietam of the American Civil War, but I think it was the bloodiest battle overall of the American Civil War, because Gettysburg lasted about three days. Um, if you think this battle, you know, obviously this battle's taken place over a couple of days, but the bulk of the fighting has taken place on the first, on the second day, sorry. Um, you know, it was, it was just that one assault that cost a few thousand casualties on either side on the first day. Um, so the bulk of the fighting has been on the second day, but you, you consider something like the Battle of Gettysburg, which took place over three days. Bearing in mind, at Gettysburg, they were still using the same tactics as Napoleon. You know, they were still using close-order formations and things like that. But the weaponry was far more advanced than what Napoleon had. You know, most troops had access to rifles. You know, the personal arms were, were much more effective than the muskets that Napoleon was using 50 years earlier. Um, most artillery was rifled. You had shells that exploded. You know, you had kind of more modern artillery. And even then, um, this battle still exceeds Gettysburg. 
you know, in terms of total combined casualties. So that's just incredible. That just speaks to how ferocious this fighting actually was. Borodino would prove to be the bloodiest single day of the Napoleonic Wars. The Russian army could not fight another battle until it had received major reinforcements. And so Kutuzov decided that he must abandon Moscow. On the 15th of September, a week after his victory at Borodino, Napoleon entered the city. He would find it virtually deserted, and already the first fires starting to burn. All right, so we're at the end of this particular video. So I'm assuming the next video will be um, Napoleon's eventual retreat from Moscow, uh, which is where, you know, his downfall really starts to sort of kick into high gear. So again, another fantastic video, as always, by Epic History TV. So um, leave some comments in the comment section below. Let's get some discussion going. But in the meantime, thank you all so much for watching, and I shall see you all on the next one.